My name's Nigel Lubbock. I'm Senior Director at Steele's Law Solicitors based here in Norwich and in London. Um, we specialise in business law, but particularly all law relating to technology. Uh, tonight, my fellow presenter is uh, James Hopgood, who's a solicitor, and I have another colleague, Kate Ford, who's on the drums there. Um, <laughs> essentially, what we want to talk about is something incredibly tedious, but terribly, terribly important. So uh, I admire you all for being here because it is not uh, a particularly attractive subject, but it is incredibly important to you and you ignore it at your peril. OK, um, I, at this stage I should be referring you to a, a very wordy slide, and, but I can read it to you. And it says this, this is one of the principles within the general data protection uh, regulations and it says rapid te technological developments and globalization have brought new challenges to the protection of personal data. The scale of collection and sharing of personal data has increased significantly. Technology allows both private companies and public authorities to make use of personal data on an unprecedented scale. Natural persons, and that's what we're talking about, not companies, natural persons increasingly make personal information available publicly and globally. Technology has transformed both the economy and social life and should further facilitate the free flow of personal data. So you've got the gist there. Basically, we're in a world dominated by personal data. And the transfer to third countries while ensuring a high level of the protection of personal data. So, in effect, there's an explosion of personal data, whether it's on your social media, whether it's through uh, your development uh, of technologies and such like. There's an explosion of personal data. Now, what, what that has meant, and they're really two or three themes for the, throughout the whole evening, is that a, a tremendous danger has emerged from this explosion of personal data. I think there was a, 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 the Javelin um, uh, analysis of um, uh, American uh, IT um, uh, background in 2017, it was earlier this year, reckoned that there was £16 billion worth of uh, money, uh, £16 billion worth of money lost as a result of identity theft. And the last statistics we had were for last year, and there was a 32% rise in the number of people who had their identity stolen. So what you've got is the potential of massive abuse and misuse. And what these regulations do, and they're coming into law, and I'll explain when in a minute, um, they try to introduce two um, major new pillars. The first is uh, a tremendous expansion of the rights of the individual uh, for the protection of their personal data, which is greatly expanded. It's no longer just name and address. It's greatly expanded. There's a much tighter net. And the counterbalance of that is anybody who processes that and we'll come on to that, and you'll be surprised what processing means, has a tremendous statutory accountability now. So you have big, big developments of what is personal data and the rights of the individual balanced with massive uh, accountability of those businesses that pro process um, uh, personal data. So what is the GDPR? Um, the GD GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulations, which come into force in England next year on the 28th of May. Brexit will not uh, get you off the hook. They, these will happen, Brexit or not, by then. And we'll, it will continue as well. Um, what it does is it, 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 it achieves those two issues that I mentioned, broadening the scope of personal data, in greatly increasing the accountability for the way the data is processed. Um, it's about accountability 
and about personal rights. And every single person, it doesn't matter whether you're the Prime Minister or a person walking down London Street, you have the same big basket of rights about your personal data. Um, and what that means for developers is that privacy now has to be the very core of your design. Everything you do has got to come back to privacy and, and your clients will expect that of you. Um, and back by that, and I was talking to one of the other the guests here tonight, we're very good at implementing regulations and there's a zeal about at the moment. And so you've got this newfound accountability and there's some really heavy penalties that could come if you get it wrong. And there's no m minor limit to this. It doesn't matter how big your business is, you potentially could be hit with a very hefty fine, up to 4% of your turnover, uh, or um, another financial penalty much greater than that, or uh, you could be closed down. And there is this, this zeal to implement this. Now, rightly or wrongly, I'm not here to talk about whether this is a good thing about personal data. I'm just telling you, I'm the messenger, don't shoot me. I'm telling you what the problem is going to be for everybody who processes data. So the five questions that we want you to uh, consider. Um, James and I will split up the discussion of those five questions. The first one is, um, these are for you to ask, am I uh, dealing with personal data? Um, the second one is, what am I doing and I, am I allowed to do it? Um, and that has changed. The whole concept of consent, which under the Data Protection Act 1998, um, um, was almost a tick box exercise, can no longer be dealt with like that in an implied fashion. Consent has to now be informed and uh, relate to the actual processing. Is my storage secure enough? And basically, if you lay off your storage to a, a third party, you're liable. Yeah, so you're going to have to check not only that your systems are secure, but your contractors as well. Um, what about the data subject? We're going to be talking about the data subject. What, are the, what is this big basket of rights that I'm talking about? And then lastly, James is going to frighten you to death by telling you what if you get it wrong. Throughout, we're going to look at it from three different angles. One is consent. That, that, that is the key, the consent of the data subject. Two is your accountability. And three is risk. Now, when I keep saying your accountability, every single person in here should be interested in the other side because it's your personal data as well, which is out there. So everything we talk about as a data subject, you are all data subjects. So here we go. Question number one. Am I dealing with personal data? Um, well, almost certainly you are. Um, you, uh, personal data is any information that relates to an identifiable natural person. Now, as I said before, it'd be name and address is the obvious, but what the regulations have done is they've expanded the definition of identification. So now it, it, it picks up any form of, um, any, any form of um, uh, details which enable you to identify a natural person. And so, and it can be a combination, so it can be an identification number. It could be location data, not even the name and address, but the location. It could be an online um, IP address. Um, it could be a, a, an IMEI, and any combination of that. So, um, it could be personnel notes that don't actually put a name there, but identify somebody's condition, mental health or uh, bodily condition. It can be cookies. It can be all sorts of information that lead back eventually to an individual, and that is now classified as personal data. So um, the, the next point is I only need to worry if I'm processing personal data right, 
But what is processing? I mean, you can imagine that people are in data banks processing, give, putting names and addresses in databases and that. Well, that's not, not that's, that's a very narrow idea. Processing is literally having the data, collecting it, storing it, retrieving it, using it, erasing it, destroying it. Even when you have finished with the data and you destroy it, you are processing data, so everything we talk about covers that full spectrum. And there's a further area as well. You will all know about, and you be, all being up to date uh, businesses, you'll all know about privacy policies and uh, uh, IT communications policies, and you want to monitor what goes through uh, your IT systems. Uh, monitoring of personal data is processing it. So, for example, if you said to your workforce, um, we're going to periodically monitor emails that go in and out or texts that go through um, the, the mobile phones, and you come across something that uh, is uh, personal to them, you are, you are processing. And so all this law relates to... Um, that activity. So it's very, very difficult to um, see any situation where personal data is not being processed. Okay, so next one then. Um, so what do you hear a lot about data processors and controllers? Well, processors are the people who are actually collecting, storing, um, who are destroying, who are looking at, or using it in some way, or monitoring it. They're the processors. The data controllers are the managers or the owners of the business who are the people who decide whether and how data is to be um, processed. And what's the new development in these regulations is that both the processors and the controllers are now responsible for the personal data. And <coughs> directors of a company will be personally liable as well as the company being liable for breaches of these regulations. So there's a very, very long um, stretch of the arm to catch people. OK, so what personal data do I have? Well, um, there's a, you've probably all heard about what was called sensitive personal data. Sensitive personal data was stuff like uh, ethnicity, religion, trade union membership, um, health and such like. These are now called special categories of personal data. Um, and, and these are um, highly regulated and, and these are um, highly protected. And therefore your privacy uh, concentration needs to be geared to protecting special categories of personal data. Um, what you need to ask yourselves in your business is, do you really need the personal data that you've got? Do you really need it? Because if you don't, then you'll hear later that the data subject can demand that you get shot of it. Um, consent is the key, uh, and as I alluded to earlier, um, but you've got to prove it. And the big difference now is you've got to actually give what's called a privacy notice to the data subject to say what you're going to do with the data. You can't just say, can we have your data and can we use it? You've got to say, can we use it as a database to, to mail you for further business? Can we uh, use it to um, uh, pass on to an, uh, a third party? You've got to say what you're going to use it for. Um, if they are your employees, then you've got to say what, what you're keeping it for to comply with HMRC, um, to comply with certain employment uh, provisions. Um, and, and you're going to have to, if there's a problem, this is very much the current vogue of legislation. It's geared to outcomes. If you make a ricket and you get it wrong, everything starts back from there. You have to prove that you've done it right. So it's, it's outcomes driven. So you have to prove that the consent has been freely given, that the individual was informed as to what you were going to do. And it, it, so if, if, if the consent is not right and it's wishy-washy, it won't get you out of jail.
OK. So um, let's have a look at this. Um, this is a new concept. It's incredibly dull, but um, it's, it's called the Data Protection I Impact Assessments. And it, it goes to the point I made earlier about um, privacy being at the centre of your development. And businesses now, particularly when they've got that highly sensitive personal data, have to carry out uh, an assessment of the way that they use um, personal data. And recently we were consulted by a, a fairly well-known engineering company down on the south coast and said, can you, um, can you look over the way we use data uh, and our data protection formula and that. And when we actually went through, it was quite amazing, A, how much data they used and what they used it for, B, how little consent they had, and C, how, uh, how vulnerable they were. And as, as I was talking to one of the guests earlier, um, obviously all, all this um, extra legislation does create bureaucracy and makes you vulnerable to um, vexatious or uh, litigious um, data subjects. So you, know, you get it wrong at your peril. So um, whilst it's not a legal requirement for every business to have a data protection impact assessment, um, it's certainly going to help if something went wrong, if you could demonstrate that you carried out an impact assessment. And it needn't be sophisticated, it just needs to be what data are we using, what are we using it for, have we got consent, what are we going to do about it. So um, there are special areas where you must carry out a data impact assessment, where you're using new technologies, processing is likely to result in high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals. And that is using that sensitive, uh, highly secure uh, data that I referred to. But I think it's good practice that every business should consider a data, um, uh, a data, Im uh, a prote data protection impact assessment. So I'm now going to hand over to James. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think we keep coming back to three simple concepts when we're both thinking about the GDPR. And realistically, the first issue is consent. We're <coughs> talking about what consent actually means and when you have it, when you don't. The second is accountability. It's no secret that the purpose of the GDPR is to try and put you as individuals and data subjects back in control of your personal data making people who have your personal data and make use of it more accountable to you, tell you why they have it, what they're going to do with it, making sure that you've given permission to that person, to that use, and risk. Everything in the GDPR is risk-driven. If you're doing something which could cause harm to an individual, whether that's economic harm, if it's possibly emotional harm, then you need to be more cautious. You need to take a much heavier approach. You need to make sure your procedures are robust. You need to make sure everything is evidenced and documented much more comprehensively. Now, the issue we need to think about here is, OK, you've got personal data. You're a data processor or a data controller. The fact that you're doing something with personal data means that you have obligations. So then the next key thing in putting personal data back at the heart of your operations, and that's really what the GDPR is designed to do, to make you think about uh, personal data and the processing of it as a core operation of your business. You need to think what you're doing with it. Now, this is a good time to remind you of the eight principles that exist currently in similar form under the, deep, under the Data Protection Act. The key one we're going to <coughs> is... Use, the use of personal data normally and transparently. But we're also going to touch on the next uh, few as well. Okay, can you the next slide? Terminal processing simply means having legitimate grounds for collecting and using personal data. You shouldn't use it in a way which is likely to cause harm, and you shouldn't use it in a way which is inconsistent with the purpose for which it was given. So if you tell somebody, <coughs> right, we're going to... Uh, 
uh, send you a newsletter, but you're actually going to do data aggregation, you're going to do statistical processing on that data and work out uh, how many under 25s are using your website. That's not a purpose for which the data was originally given to you. It's fine if you tell somebody that's what you're going to do with their personal data, but if you don't, you can't do it. Transparency is key. Touch on that. Handle personal data in the ways the data set it would reasonably expect. Essentially, do with others personal do with others personal data as you would wish others to do with yours. And don't use it for unlawful purposes. Well, kind of goes without saying, but don't use it for any purpose which discriminates against individuals. Uh, for instance, if you were to use it to disadvantage a particular demographic you're creating a risk of real harm to that individual, and it's an unlawful purpose. Okay. Now, a reminder, Nigel's touched on it, but consent is the key for you. Consent, accountability, and risk. Can you prove that you have consent? If you can't prove you have it, then you probably don't. What do you want to do? Have you told data subjects what it is that you want to do with your personal data? Is it specific for specific purposes? Is it freely given? And it's not a get out of jail free card. Now we'll come on to that in a second, but essentially in a little more detail. You need to make sure that you have an audit of all the data, all the personal data that you already hold about individuals. You need to be sure and confident about where that data has come from. When the GDPR comes into force, if you have data without a trail of custody back to the data subject and back to the moment they gave consent, then you have a problem. Consent must be freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous. Well, that's a new definition of consent under the GDPR. But it also rules out certain options that were <coughs> Three tick boxes are specifically envisaged by the, D by the GDPR and should no longer be used. It's much more about putting individuals in control. If an individual wants you to use their personal data, they should tell you by a clear act that that's what they want you to do. Because there's nothing wrong with you asking the individual. Consent must be specific, clear, prominent, properly documented and not presumed. Easy enough. Subjects should be able to withdraw their consent, and you need to be clear about how they withdraw consent. Consent should be sought to the extent only actually needed. Well, this is what I mean by it's not a get out of jail free card. It's quite easy and quite tempting to tell people, this is a list of things we might well do with your personal data. If you do that, you probably don't have consent. Because if an individual is consented to every possible purpose for the processing of their personal data under the sun, they don't know what you're actually going to do with it. And that's the point. You need to, in a very simple, clear and intelligible way, tell lay people on the street what data you're getting from them, why you want it, what you're going to do with it, how long you're going to have it. What happens if there's a problem? Now, this is my way of trying to give a practical, practical demonstration of consent. Um, we've protected the name of the entity for obvious reasons. Um, and there's no reason to think that, of course, there won't be a review to ensure compliance with the GDPR comprehensively. There's good and bad on the page. There's you know, room for improvement. I think. All organisations have room for improvement. And that's, again, part of the driver here, putting personal data at the core of what you do and working out from it. As I was saying to Mark earlier, one of the key things you need to think about is personal data has an inherent value to your business. And a lot of what the GDPR is designed to do, a lot of the general principles, are consistent with principles of good business. If you are disclosing data Really you're giving away something of value to your business, so it's worth protecting it from the start and worth getting it right. The good on this page is there is quite clearly here 
a message of why can you remember better than me? What's not so I didn't see these boxes. So, from the very start, there's a problem of have I actually given consent? Have I actually said there's a controller here? Yeah, it's okay for you to use my personal data. At the bottom, okay, there is actually a non-tick box. That's fine. What it actually says is, please tick this box to confirm you've read the numbers of the terms and conditions. Now, if you're a bit sad like me, I can dig around in the terms and conditions. And in the terms and conditions, there's a link to the privacy policy, which does and then does want to say, this is why we need your personal data, this is how we're going to use it, and so on and so forth. The problem is, to get there, I had to go through two screens. And who's going to actually bother to do that? Ideally, what you want here is a clear reference to the privacy policy. A clear reference to, by taking this box, you agree that we will process your data in accordance with our privacy policy. Click here. Because then, you've got <coughs> clear, unambiguous consent for a specific purpose which has been given to the data subject. So, good, bad, okay. The problem here is this is on the back of end of an insurance quote, by which time I entered a huge amount of <coughs> What would be best is if right at the start there were a reference to the privacy policy. Before you start, we're going to ask you this, 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 and this. Is the we're going to share your data with third parties. They're going to provide you with a quote. Best practice. Now, <coughs> as with the Data Protection Act, consent is your best way of evidencing um, fair and lawful processing. Consent, provided it's done right, is best. You can, in very, very limited circumstances, also process personal data if it's for one of these reasons on screen. If, you have a legit, if it's a legitimate interest of the data subject, performance of a contract or obligation between you and the data subject, it's to fulfil a legal obligation, to protect the vital interests of the individual, or to complete performance of a public interest activity. Two points from that. One, these are very limited situations. Not all of them may apply. And two, why on earth wouldn't you get consent? Because if you can get consent, if you can show you've told an individual in clear terms, what's the problem? That individual then is able to make an informed choice and is back in the driving seat. Accountability. The key thing about the GDPR is making sure you can show you've given thought to personal data. Can, have you got records to show how consent was given? It's not enough just to say, well, these individuals entered their details and ticked the box, so their names appear in my database. Keep a screenshot of what form they actually filled out. Every time you update the form, update your records. But more than that, what you need to have in place are a robust set of documents which show You've given thought to the risks. Have you trained your staff? Have you audited what you're actually doing on the ground? Have you reviewed your policies and procedures? <coughs> now, it's not just enough to actually have the best data protection policy under the sun, because you've actually got to follow through with it. And it always looks worse if you have a policy in place which you just don't ignore. It sits in a dusty desk. But at least it's a good starting point. It gives you something to point to and say, yeah, we've thought about this, we've thought about the risks, we've thought about how we're going to mitigate against the risks. Maintain relevant documents on processing activities. Show what you are doing with personal data. Consider appointing a data protection officer. Now, some organisations, if they're doing predominantly higher risk activities with lots of personal data on a large scale, have to have a data protection officer, have to have a named individual who coordinates their activities. Some businesses are going to be of a size where that's wildly disproportionate. But somewhere in the middle, there's probably a point where you might want to think about appointing a named individual who coordinates your activities as an organisation. 
even if you don't strictly have to do so. Because again, if there's any queries, if there's any problems, there's a first point of intervention. And if you're ever the subject of an inquiry by the ICO, if you're ever taken to court, again, it's something you can point to, you can put your finger on it and say, you know what, we identified this, we've given it some thought, we've tried our best. You're not expected to be completely infallible, but you're expected to show that you've done all that you can. Use data impact assessments. Nigel's talked about that. Some people have to do them, again. Some organisations don't. Why wouldn't you, as an organisation, sit down and think about it? Audit the personal data that you have, audit the personal data that you're likely to have going forward. Audit the ways in which you're going to use it. Give the matter a bit of thought. Implement data protection by design. Now, this is a new concept in the GDPR. Data protection by design means that you have to essentially start with the premise that personal data is valuable and must be protected and work outwards. It's very tempting to start with the premise, this is what we want to do. Can we do it? Oh, wait, there's personal data involved. <coughs> the GDPR envisages a, a regulatory system where you start with the premise that you have personal data and it must be protected. So then it becomes, can we do what we want to do? Think about data minimization. If you don't need personal data, why have it in the first place? Think about this new word, pseudonymization. I think the closest I can get in terms of pronunciation. Pseudonymization is a concept based on German law, which is basically about using functions to try and strip out personal data where possible. So you might use a hashing function to hide names, to hide personal data, particularly if you're giving that data to third parties for a different purpose. So medical studies are probably a good example, albeit quite a high level one. If you're sharing data about patients, what you might want to do is, pseudon is use a hashing function, use a similar function, to encode, to strip out the personal data, so that the person you're giving the data to is only able to use the bits they actually need to. But they can still track back to an individual if they need to, but that individual is no longer identifiable as a living individual. And that's the key. You might also decide to implement some measure of that on your own systems. You might have, on one server, data which is hashed. On the other, or elsewhere, you might have the key. So you can reverse the function. Transparency. Think about how you're going to evidence compliance. Allowing individuals to monitor this. It's a requirement now. You actually have to think about how you're going to allow individuals input in the, pro in the life cycle of their data. Creating and improving security fe features. Again, good business sense and something I think everybody needs to give some thought to. Nigel's going to talk about privacy notices in a bit. But the privacy notice is your key defense. And there's, there's certain information that you have to give the data subject at the point of collection about what you're going to do their data. Record keeping is more cumbersome under the GDPR. Larger organisations, that's organisations with more than 250 employees, <coughs> properly documented set of records about what they're doing with the data. Smaller organisations only need to do this if they're processing higher risk data, so data about a person's race, about their political beliefs, about their religious opinions. These are all things that are regarded as higher risk. And also data which might uh, cause harm to the individuals. Apparently. Well, you can think about doing that. But again, give the matter some thought. Because the more you think about it, the more you think about what you're going to do with data, the fewer problems you're going to have later on down the line. Sharing data. Now, this is a key issue for some of you here. If you are going to pass on data, 
it's very important for third parties outside your organisation, it's very important that you have consent of the data subject to do that. If you are basically going to, irrespective of whether you're going to transfer the data, if you're going to actually allow someone else to see it, the data subject should have consented. <coughs> In circumstances, you can be responsible for the actions of third parties with whom personal data is shared. There should be a chain of custody with personal data, right through from the moment that you collect it, to the moment you use it, to the moment you store it, to the moment you share it, to the moment you delete it. Everything you've done there should be clearly documented, evidenced, and traced back to consent. Privacy policies and procedures to ensure compliance, and not just yours, I should say, but also third parties. So make sure people with whom you share data have procedures in place themselves, because the last thing you want, the last thing you want, is for that person to misuse the data, and then it's well, why did you check? I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time transferring data, but essentially, the GDPR applies if you are processing the data. <coughs> now, we're going to be heading out of the European Union, we hear, but we may well be processing data of EU citizens in any event, so you still need to think about the GDPR. But the interaction between the UK and the European Union isn't going to stop by Brexit, even the I think everybody accepts that, no matter what the terms of Brexit look like. Switzerland, which isn't part of the EU, but does have arrangements in place with the EU, a complicated network of things, um, still has to have similar terms to protect personal data because of the interaction between its businesses and businesses in the EU. That's likely to be the same with Brexit. There's already proposals to put in place a new Data Protection Act as well. So once the UK leaves, the likelihood is the vast plank of the GDPR will still be brought into domestic law in any event. Because it's actually going to be in force from uh, May 2018, the current proposal to the Great Repeal Bill, I mean, it's also likely to apply anyway. So one way or another, you're caught. And the point is, any domestic scheme is going to look remarkably similar to this. I'm not going to talk about Carry on. situations where you can find to work outside the EU in any great detail, safe to say that in some cases it's permitted, but it's only to countries which are deemed to have an adequate level of protection, or where you've built in protections, so there are standard there are standard contractual clauses you can have in place, which are published by the European Commission, uh, build those into contracts if you're sending data offshore, or there's consent or other level of protection. So we've established that we've worked, out <coughs> we've worked out that you can actually do what you want to do with that personal data. The next step in the life cycle of personal data is storage. And the GDPR introduces new issues here again. Firstly, think about privacy from design. Think about making sure your systems are sufficiently robust. Think about what personal data you have and adjust your level of security accordingly. It's not rocket science, but if you've got personal data which is likely to be harmful if it ever gets out, if someone ever hacks into your system, you must have much, much, much stronger security than your average run-of-the-mill business. But one of the ordinary businesses should still put in place easy measures they can. User access controls, password requirements. Not difficult. Make sure you have policies and procedures. Make sure you, that your employees know what to do with personal data. There's a reference in the GDPR now to actually making sure, okay, give me a backup slide, um, that you use state-of-the-art technology. Again, state-of-the-art technology is going to change as time moves on. As time moves on, the level of security that should become standard by default will increase. Managing risk. Again, putting 
personal data back at the core of what you do as an organization. Encryption, pseudonymization we've mentioned previously, uh, other steps to de-identify personal data. If you can, look at personal data, take personal data, <coughs> and strip it back so it's no longer capable of identifying an individual, great, because then it ceases to be personal data and you're into a whole different regulatory regime, much less ferocious regulatory regime. Now, it's anticipated you might not be able to do that, in which case think about other steps, think about keeping it securely. Think about isolating personal data. Think about restricting who's got access to it. The more people that can look at personal data, obviously the more problematic. You've got cases under the current DPA, uh, Data Protection Act regime of people being prosecuted because they've gone onto their employer's servers Found data about people they don't happen to like, or even worse, just sold personal data. That data, obviously, two things, has a value to your organisation, if that's what your business does. Most businesses are in some way centred around a core of information. And it creates problems for you. It creates liability under the UK. The, least, the, the, the less information that you can have... <coughs> approach to personal data. You need to take a three-pronged approach to risk. Look at what potential harm there is. Look at the severity of the harm if the data gets out, and consider the likelihood that it's going to happen. You're not expected to do everything under the sun, but give the matter some thought. Okay. Thank you. Data protection officers. I've covered this off briefly earlier, but essentially Certain businesses which are involved in doing high-risk activities on a large scale will be expected to have a central person in charge of their data protection efforts. If you can generally, as a business, have a point of contact, have someone that's in charge, fine, great, do it. The GDPR also sets up a new regime about data breaches. We're talking here about accidental loss, disruption, alteration, disclosure, access to personal data. Now this can happen in different ways. This can happen obviously someone maliciously hacking into your server, but it's also accidental breaches. It's leaving client papers in our case, not in our because we don't do it, on a train in our sector. That's what say, on a train. That's a data breach because it's an unauthorised disclosure of somebody's personal data, of data about to living in so if this happens, there are now a string of uh, reactions that have to take place, or actions that have to take place. If a data processor is subject to a data breach, so if someone hacks into your cloud server, your cloud provider needs to tell you if you are the data controller. They need to actually tell you this has happened, what's, what's happened, what personal data has got out there. If you are the data controller, so if you are the person, the organisation, who is determining the purpose for which data is processed, then you need to tell the ICO in the UK, in the EU, the competent authority, national authority, as soon as possible and within a maximum of 72 hours. Now, there are exceptions to these, but they're very minimal. Basically, the exceptions are in cases where <coughs> there's pretty much no risk of harm because the data, personal data that's got out is of a trivial character. But generally, you should be thinking about making reports to the ICO. If you're dealing with high risk data, and we've talked about that before, it's now a duty to tell the individual what personal data of theirs is now out there, who, what you're doing to try and mitigate the problem, who they can contact. If you are unsure whether or not you have reports, you should. And that's, that's part of the accountability mechanism, about being transparent. Data breaches, you need to think about two things. You need to think about being proactive and stopping data breaches in the first instance. And you need to be reactive. You need to keep records of what you've done, what action you're taking after it's happened. Now it's
Okay, um, I should just say that the, all these um, slides are going to be on our website from tomorrow morning. So, um, and I did warn you, it's a very tedious subject. Uh, um, it's very dense. Um, so, you've heard a lot about uh, businesses' accountability, but here is um, what this big basket of rights is for um, uh, data subjects, i.e. everyone in this room. And there they are, they're all listed. The right to be forgotten is never a problem for lawyers, but it is actually um, uh, a right once the data is no longer needed to have it uh, removed. Um, so um, the right to be informed, that I mentioned these privacy notices, you have to, as an individual, be told what the data is going to be used for. What are you going to do with it? And if the business cannot have in place a privacy notice, then almost certainly, if anything, anything goes wrong, uh, there will be a problem. Okay. Right, the right of access. Uh, you all have a right of access to any organisation that's got your personal data. At the moment, uh, you have to pay a tenner for that, uh, the details. That's all going to go. There will be no fee, so you can write to anybody. You can write to your bank, you can write to your council, you can write to whomever you like and say, what, what data do you have on me? So this comes back to my point. Whilst it's laudable that there's a great deal of protection, it is going to create an enormous amount of bureaucracy. Uh, it's not for me to say whether that is a price worth paying. That's for you individually to uh, determine. Um, the right to be forgotten is what I've just said. Essentially, uh, when, when the data is no, no longer needed, you can ask for it to be removed. OK. And so James is just going to finish up here by telling you uh, what happens if you get it wrong. Thank you, Max. Very, very quickly. Maximum price in the UK is up on the screen, 20 million euros. I've brought it down to the World Organisation's World Wide Permit. But that's the worst case scenario. Um, again, this is a low risk issue. The ICO is unlikely to impose the maximum penalty, but be wary because the potential is always there. Other things you need to think about compensation for material and material damage. Some of you may have heard of the case of Google and UV and Paul. But basically, if an individual can show that unlawful processing of their personal data has caused the non economic harm, so called alarm or distress, they're entitled to compensation. Cases of criminal liability, you mentioned it, unlawful access of by employees without the consent of the employer is a good example. In some cases, directed also personal liability, uh, case personal liability or failure to comply with an organisation's obligations. <coughs> That's a potentially expanding field. There was some talk about introducing uh, directed personal liability in the Constitution Economy Act. It keeps coming up again and again, expect it at some point in the future. And organisations which are known to have failed in their duty to protect personal data obviously face reputational damage. Adobe is a good example. Getting ready. These are some practical tips just to leave you with from the ICO. Make sure that your organisation is aware, that <coughs> you review the information you hold, make sure you look at your policies and procedures, staff handbooks, data protection policies, so on and so forth. Make sure that you're able to consent going forward. Screenshots of websites, copy of the forms, keep them on file. Think about data breaches and review your security arrangements. Start thinking about how you're going to put data protection back at the core of your operations, data protection by design, and think about appointing a data protection officer. That's really, I think, all we have to say. I don't know if we've got time for questions. Um, We'll be here if you, um, if you need it, to ask any questions. So uh, over to our host. Brilliant. Thanks very much, guys.